Before we get started tonight, I wanted to, uh, I brought these books and showed them to you before, but I want to just re-recommend them, re-remind you about them. If you're interested in doing more study into the covenants, uh, the two books I've got here tonight go in depth. What you've got on your outline is basically scratching the surface of the information you can find in this, uh, these books. This one is Things to Come by Pentecost. Probably the best book on prophecy. If you just had to get one book on understanding prophecy and interpreting prophecy, this would be the one you want. Uh, there's a lot of others out there, but none of them are even within 100 country miles of these. Okay, uh, The second one is The Millennial Kingdom by Walvoord. And um, Walvoord is probably modern-day prophecy. He's probably the guy if you want to uh, get good information on prophecy. The only difference between the two books is Pentecost is more in-depth in the book. Uh, Walvoord is a little bit more concise, but the information is, is deep. And you can go as, as deep on pretty much any subject. They cover the um, interpretative systems. Anybody remember the type of interpretations? Amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, those kind of things. They cover those. They cover the different tribulation views. They, uh, they both interpret um, dispensationally, which they keep the church where the church belongs, Israel where Israel belongs. And they'll point out, in a lot of cases, the weaknesses of the other systems where they'll show where they fail in their interpretations. Uh, so they're, they're good works to have. So if you're interested in prophecy at all, um, there, I haven't come across any newer work on prophecy that's anywhere close to these two. Uh, so uh, they would be my recommendation if you're looking at prophecy. I had to use them in my doctorate, my, my doctorate, is in theology, but it focused on New Testament prophecy. And so without those two books, I'd still largely be banging around trying to get the thing done because there's just not a lot written today that's anywhere. Most of what's written will quote these guys or else they're just out on their own making stuff up as they go. So uh, anyway, uh, that's just for what it's worth. I've got them up here. Uh, if you guys want to look at them, please take some time in class. If you want to pass them around, you can look at them instead of listening to me or... Um, Look at them in between classes, and you'll just get a quick view of how much information is in there that would really help you if you study prophecy. So, um, all right. So tonight we are studying the Davidic covenant, and we are looking primarily at the unconditional covenants. We looked at one last week. Who remembers what it was? The Mosaic covenant. And is Mosaic covenant conditional or unconditional? It is conditional. So. Um, that one was a little bit different. I added that one to the class because there's so much question about law and what all went on in law and what it was for and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> that was basically just given to give you some idea of what God was doing there. Um, as we come to the Davidic covenant, it's one of the other um, unconditional covenants. You guys remember what the unconditional covenants were? What's the first one? Abrahamic. Second one. Davidic. And what's the third one? The, the new, okay? And so we'll be looking at all those. When we get to the new covenant, we'll be looking at the new covenant in relation to the church as well as the new covenant um, as it's presented to Israel. So we'll kind of try to see the balance there. But as we go to the Davidic covenant, something we need to really kind of realize is that as we progress through Scripture, hopefully you pick this up in your Wednesday night class, uh, the nature of Scripture is progressive. God gives progressive revelation. He didn't sit down with Adam and give Adam Genesis through Revelation. He sat down with Adam and gave Adam what he needed to know. Well, a lot of your covenants are progressive as well. So when God told Abraham, you're going to be a great nation and your seed's going to be a blessing to, to the entire world, he didn't fill in all the blanks for Abraham. But as these covenants progress, we start seeing more and more how God is going to do that. So now, as we come to the Davidic covenant, we have a promise being made to David about the seed of David that will be on the throne forever. Then when we finally hit the new covenant, we're going to learn more about it. So these covenants are progressive as well as revelation. So as God is revealing different things about the gospel and different things about himself, he's also revealing deeper things about these covenants which are all related back to what nation? Israel. 
So we see that there's an ongoing contact with God concerning Israel throughout Scripture. So um, as we come to the Davidic covenant, a little bit of Hebrew history here. Uh, when this covenant is made, the people have been in the nation, in the promised land, for about 350 years. They've been there for a day or two. Um, how was it going for them? It wasn't going well. All right, if you are familiar with your Old Testament history, God told Joshua and the people entering the land to do what to all the inhabitants of Canaan? Destroy Kill them. them. All right, take them out. Cats, dogs, Cats, dogs mice, rabbits, you name it, hamsters, kill everything, right? Uh, no, no pity. Some of the tribes did that. However, one tribe in particular didn't hardly do any. Anybody remember the, the worst tribe when it came to uh, taking out the inhabitants? No, Levi was a, the priest. They, they weren't out there killing people. Well, that's what I was saying. Yeah. They, yeah. Doing yeah. <laughs> they didn't kill anybody, really. They, huh? Not Gad. Dan. 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 Uh, and. Yeah, they're like. Um, <laughs> but um, it's interesting where Dan, the history of Dan and the fact of idolatry with the, the nation of Dan. If you remember when um, um, the king of Israel, first king of Israel, divided kingdom. Who remembers his name? First king of Israel, Jeroboam. He set up one of his idols where? In Dan. In the New Testament, when Jesus took the disciples and showed them the gates of hell. Remember, the gates of hell were not a figurative. It wasn't some figurative thing that Jesus... It's a literal place. It was like the shopping mall for idol worship. And there's a sp particular spot in this area. It's a big hole, a big cave that was called the gates of hell. And so when Jesus used that term, the disciples, it'd be like us talking about the Walmart on 29. Okay, we all know where that is, right? It's a real place. It wasn't some figurative place that was just spiritual. So anybody want to guess where the gates of hell might have been located? Dan. So, um, so the lesson tonight is no, never mind. Don't, go to Dan, don't go to Dan's house. Um, the gates of hell are at Dan's house. Um, so basically the country, and Dan was just the worst tribe when it came to, to eliminating the enemy, but there were pockets of, of enemy resistance throughout the land, and eventually the nation crept into idolatry. And so God sent the judges to rule, and not actually rule, but to um, work to bring the nation back to where it was. And so it's under the time of the judges. The characteristics of the judges were summed up twice in the book of Judges, one at the beginning, one at the end. Anybody remember, actually one in the last of Joshua and one at the end of Judges. Anybody remember what it was summed up? Every man that was right in their own eyes. So there was a move not only not to obey God in ridding the land of the enemy, but there's also a move away from God into idolatry and into being uh, interested in the things of the world. And so it culminated in Israel with Samuel. Samuel was the last judge. And let's just look at this. So look over at 1 Samuel. Chapter 13. Or excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'm sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 8. First Samuel 8 verse 1 says this, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second was Abiah. And they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. This was pretty much the character of judges for a number of years. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. They were a bunch of kind people. Um, 
Thy sons walk not in, in, in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like the nations. And so the idea here was there was a progression in the nation. They didn't destroy the enemies like they were supposed to destroy. They fell into idolatry. And now they're looking around at all the nations around them and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to be like those guys. And so we find out here the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of all the people, all they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so you can read on that passage later, but basically Samuel says, All right, you're going to get a king, but be careful what you ask for, because when you get a king, here's a list of things that are going to happen, and eventually they did. So this is where the kingdom is, and God is going to give them a king. Um, and you've got to understand that did, did this catch God by surprise? So when we come to this idea of the kings, it wasn't like God being like, oh, no, they don't want judges. I, I guess I'll have to give them a king because they know better than I do. No, God still has a plan, okay? He's still going to work, and it's through their sin and their rejection of him that ultimately he's going to be glorified. And so Israel has been defeated. Uh, they're under a constant threat, and they ask for a king. Of course, we know the rest of the story, right? They get Saul. How'd that one work out for them? We've actually been to the place where Saul, was, Saul and his son's body were hung on the walls. There's the walls still there where they hung up. Anyway, anyway uh, pretty neat place. Uh, <laughs> how do you say that any other way? It's not, archaeologically, it's an interesting place. Okay, but um, So those things were all failures. And so God determines to work through the line of David to, to bring about his ultimate kingdom. It wouldn't come through uh, others. Um, the Davidic covenant is is a very interesting covenant it's an unconditional covenant it has a special significance to the kingdom of god and it points to the fact that there will be a literal millennial reign there will be a time where the seed of david will be sitting on the throne in israel ruling and reigning the entire world um, it also brings up the question that we'll look at under the new covenant how does the church fit into all this where does the church fit into all this? And then um, what about Israel? Israel being regathered. So there are all these questions about this covenant that we'll look at, uh, but God is working. So let's look at the covenant. If you remember, God promised that Judah would eventually rule. Remember, uh, we looked at it briefly, I think, week before last, Genesis chapter 49, when Jacob was... If you read the passage, supposedly Jacob's blessing his kids, but when he tells his oldest one, you're as unstable as water, I, that's not much of a blessing, I don't think. But anyway, you get through that passage, and he gets to Judah, and he tells Judah that it's through Judah that Shiloh will come. And we talk briefly about what Shiloh means. Anybody remember that one? Jesus. Not Jesus. Well, ultimately, yeah, but that's not what Shiloh means. The one who has the right, the one whose right it is, that's what the word shallow actually means. Now, ultimately, yeah, it means Jesus, but that's not what the word shallow proper means. So if you put it on the exam, you'll get it wrong, okay? Because shallow doesn't mean Jesus. It's Jesus, God. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, God, the Bible, the Holy Spirit. Um, so anyway, um, there's that promise that this ultimate ruler is going to come through the line of Judah, and then we go into the land, and Moses is in charge initially, then Joshua. Then we get into these judges, and there's one judge after another judge, and their judges are all over the place. And none of them from the tribe of Judah that I know of. There may have been one, um, but they weren't ruling. Um, and then we come to the point where Israel rejects God. We just read that. Saul was a king. Um, he failed spiritually and politically. Let's look at a little bit of this. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. And this is where Saul decided he was going to do what he wanted to do. It says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made the end of the offering, the offering, uh, end of offering the burnt offering, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what have thou done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me 
Thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gather themselves together at Michmash, therefore I said, and he goes on and makes, continues making his excuses for taking authority that wasn't his. Uh, and so he fell, failed spiritually. Um, immediately, if you notice that passage, when he meets Samuel, Samuel says, hey, what, what have you done? Saul immediately starts, uh, he blames the people. Then he blames Samuel for not being there on time. Then he blames the Philistines. He does everything except take responsibility for doing a wrong action. And then ultimately over in chapter 15, uh, we find more of this. Um, so we come to David. Samuel finds David, anoints him as king, and David begins this relationship with Saul. And we're not going to go through all of that because we're looking at the covenant, but uh, if you have time, you may want to go back and read through. There's a number of years between the time David was anointed and between David actually became king. And when David started ruling, um, anybody know where he started ruling? Hmm? Mizpah. Mizpah. Um, and then uh, the city of David, he went to what's called the city of David, which is actually outside of Jerusalem. Um in fact, they are currently excavating the original palace of David now, and it's not within the walls of Jerusalem proper. It's like there's Jerusalem proper, then there's a street, and then you go down a hill, and all the way down the hill, they're excavating the city of David. And so uh, we learned some interesting things. We're in Israel. Mount Zion, which most people think is Jerusalem, is really right outside the walls of Jerusalem. So you've got Mount Zion, the city of David, and Jerusalem. They're all within a stone's throw of each other. I guess generically it's the same place, but I guess if you want to do it exegetically, they're not. But um, So David eventually moved everything to Jerusalem, but initially he was outside. Um, he's a descendant of Judah, and he's filling that prophecy. So uh, let's look at this covenant. Let's look at the Davidic covenant. Let's go to 2 Samuel. And... Again, I'm kind of rushing through the history. We could spend the rest of the year on the history of David and Samuel, and or David, Samuel, Saul, and Jonathan, and all that went on there before we even get here, but we want to look at this covenant. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're just going to look at the characteristics and who's involved in the covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and if my little thingy here will go, okay. Um, 2 Samuel 7, verse number 1, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, See, now I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And the places where I have walked, and all the children of Israel spake, I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I have commanded to feed my people, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? So basically God's saying, I haven't asked for a house. Uh, David wanted to, just wanted to build one. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following sheep to be ruler over my people, over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thine sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in the place of their own land. And move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. As since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, I have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee, he will make thee in house. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever." So we see in a nutshell right there in those last two verses, this whole thing. David told Nathan, I want to build God a house. God tells Nathan, go back and tell David, you're not going to build me a house. Um, your son will build a house, but I'm going to establish the throne forever. And so the people that are involved in this, this uh, covenant, we see first there's God. God initiates this. We see that in verses 8 through 16. This is 
uh, everything God is saying. Um, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established. And so God is telling David, I'm going to do this for you forever. Um, you're not going to do it. The might of Solomon's not going to do it. God's going to do it forever. Um, Israel is involved in this, obviously, back in verses 10 and 11. We saw him describe that uh, he took Israel, he took them out of Egypt, and now he's going to allow them to make a house for him. Solomon is mentioned. And then, uh, of course, David in verses 7, 11, and 16. And so this is a covenant God is making with David, telling him that you're going to die, but your seed is going to remain, have a throne forever and ever. And this is something that's not going to change. It's not going to go away. Um, look over to the book of Psalms for a minute. Psalm chapter 89. Psalm 89, and we see some more about this covenant and the nature of it. Psalm 89, um, let's just start in verse 1. Psalm 89, 1 says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. That's like a song now, isn't it? Okay. Um, for I've said, mercy shall be built up forever, thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. Now notice verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen, I have sworn unto my servant David, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And then the word selah, which means just sit back and think about that one. Okay, Meditate on that. God is going to do this work forever. That points to the unconditional nature of the covenant. It also points to the unchangeable nature of the covenant. This is something that God says he is going to do, um, and we can rest in that. It's almost like salvation. God said he'll save us, right? Do we believe him or not? I hope you believe him, and if you believe him, you can find some comfort in that. So we see here the, the uh, unconditional nature and the eternal nature of the covenant. Look down in verse number 34 of this chapter. He says in verse number 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness, uh, that word loving kindness is an interesting word. Um, it's a Hebrew word chesed, or chesed, if you want to pronounce it like a Hebrew. And it's, it points to the loving loyalty of God. It's basically the Old Testament equivalent of agape. Um, very important word. It's a very important thematic word in the Old Testament. If you trace that word, uh, you'll find it used over and over again by God directing it toward the relationship he has with his people. The fact that God is always loving. He's always loyal. He's always going to follow through. Um, I don't know. If, I may be wrong, but I don't know for sure it's ever used in the relation of God's people toward God. I'm pretty sure, and I may be wrong, um, that it's always used from God toward his people. So if you guys want an extra credit assignment, trace down the word chess said in the Old Testament and read every reference and see if it ever refers from God's people back to God. And I'll give you an extra bonus point. Okay, no takers on that one, huh? Uh, so anyway, nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Now, what this points to is there is going to be times in this Davidic covenant that to the casual observer, it's going to look like God has failed David. When would you say it would look like God has failed David? When Absalom takes over. Okay, just even when David's alive, when Absalom takes over. How about when the nation of Judah goes into captivity? There's nobody on the throne. There's not a throne. What about when Rome destroys Jerusalem and disperses the people? And there's no Israel again until basically 1948. Do you, do you think God lost track of the descendants of, of David in the line of Judah? No. So God's promises are sure. It doesn't mean that there will always be a throne in Israel, but for eternity there will be. Does that make sense to you? Uh, Israel, because of their sin, will forfeit the blessings of the land from time to time. And they'll forfeit that, that idea of having their own control. 
But God's never going to take his faithfulness away from that promise, away from David. He's never going to remove his loving kindness. Notice verse 34. He says, my covenant I will not break nor alter the thing gone out from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as, as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. So again, we have this very sure promise that this covenant that God has made with David is going to stand. Um, and even during David's life, there may have been times where he kind of had to step back and say, wow, I wonder how this is going to work out. But God has promised it. Let's look at another one pointing to how um, eternal, how unshakable this promise is. Look over to Jeremiah chapter 33. And this kind of gets into some of the things you guys want to look at. As we start getting into this covenant and the new covenant especially, we're going to see more uh, things from prophecy here. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse number 22. Jeremiah 33, 22 says this, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Um, Look down in verse number 25. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and my David my servant, so I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the house, or the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return, and I will have mercy on them. Basically, he's saying, all these things are going on, but I'm going to be faithful. It looks like I'm going to fail them. Uh, it looks like things are not going to work out. Uh, the people have rejected me. They're in captivity. But ultimately, I'm going to be faithful to the promises I've made. And remember when I'm, we started this, I mentioned how this the nature of these covenants is progressive. Look down if you're in, in um, Jeremiah, verse number 26. He starts out speaking of the seed of Abraham. Remember when we were looking at the Abrahamic covenant, that idea of the seed of Abraham was very important. Here we are way, way later in history, referring to the seed of David, and we see how this idea is building and building and how God is working through his promises. Uh, so he's going to cause them to continue. He's going to cause that the throne of David to endure forever. So the participants in the covenant, uh, God, Israel, Solomon, David, and the descendants of David, it's all unconditional. God is doing the work. Um, let's go back and look at some of the elements of the covenant. What's going to specifically take place? What specific things did God uh, promise to David. So let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And in verse 9, the promise to David is that God will make David's name great in the world. It says in 2 Samuel 7, 9, I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name likened to the name of great men that are in earth. So we see that God, during the lifetime of David, had already fulfilled this aspect. God made David this promise that he would be made great, and he was. And again, we see who is the, the driving force behind the greatness of David. God, okay? Um, we, we've got to be careful when we talk about men, especially in the Old Testament, um, you know, David is like a lot of people's Old Testament hero. Um, but I'll be honest with you, David was a train wreck. You look at his life, you look at his kids' lives, you look at decisions he made. Um, the guy was a mess. The only reason David got to where David went was because of the power of God working in spite of David most of the time. Okay, well, people are like, well, God, David was a man after God's own heart. Yeah, there, at times, at times we've got people after God's own heart, right? And, and I, I, I'll be honest with you folks, be careful not to put biblical characters on a pedestal they don't belong on. Because if you do a, a real study of some of these Old Testament heroes, I mean, there's a guy one time I thought I was going to have to fight when we were looking at the life of David and we're looking at the actual facts of David's life versus the uh, the cartoon character David, you know, the, the the sweet, gentle, pure shepherd boy who who was all this compared to the the adulterer and the murderer and uh, the the conniver and all the other things that David did. He didn't like that, like, but that's the picture of David. That's just showing 
what we are without the grace of God. And the only reason David had the covenant made with him was because of the grace of God. And the only reason he became a great man was because of the grace of God, not because of the character of David. Now God used him, and that should be a great encouragement. God used him to do great things. God used him to write a big chunk of the Old Testament. Um, but David is a life we look at, and there are a lot of things in David's life that uh, we really... Uh, that's like holding Samson up as a, a hero, right? I mean, you ever study the life of Samson? That guy was a for real mess, okay? Now, did he do some good things? Yeah, but how did he do it? Through the empowerment of God. So we've got to keep that in mind when we think about these Old Testament guys. Um, so David's name was great because of what God did. Um, David had rest from his enemies. We see this here down in verse number 11. Uh, I will give thee rest. That idea of rest carries over into the New Testament for us even, doesn't it? It's a different type of rest. But when we look at this idea of rest, we see that God is constantly working in the lives of his people to bring them to a place of rest. And I know in, in the Old Testament, it was actually physical rest from people who wanted to chop David's heads off, uh, head off, but uh, he, he had more than one head. Uh, hmm? the, yeah, fun fact about David. Um but anyway, uh, David would have a house. Look down in Second Samuel chapter 7, verse number 16. He says, And the house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee thy throne shall be established forever. Um, the word house here has the idea of a ruling dynasty that would continue forever. It referred to physical descendants, and ultimately we know the, the, the end of that line is who? Jesus, he's the eternal line of David who will rule forever. He's the one that will bring the house, the dynasty of David, to a place of glory and a place of prominence that it's never been before. Uh, David's promised a kingdom, and uh, there are many people, uh, in fact, these guys here, when you talk about the millennial kingdom, they believe that David will have a part of ruling in the actual millennial kingdom under Christ, that he'll function as some kind of a sub-ruler, because of the promise that God made him in the covenant. Now, I don't know if you agree with that or not. It really doesn't matter. Um, you can read these guys and argue with them. I'm just telling you what they said. Um, but the point is, he, he has a kingdom. Um, and then David would have a throne, and this has the idea of authority, and his throne would be eternal. Again, um, notice the promise in verse number 16, Thy throne shall be established forever. And so... That doesn't necessarily mean that David will be on that throne forever, but that someone from the line of David will be on that throne forever. Um, and so that points to, to the fact of God's promises. So let's go to the next page. Terms of the covenant. This is an unconditional covenant. David didn't do anything to earn it. He was just sheep boy until God uh, sent Samuel to anoint him as, as king. Um, what do we call that? Okay, what do we call it? Give me the Bible word. If you're in my Wednesday night class, you should know this word. All of you, just go run right now. Just file poles. Ask the question just, again. What do we call it when God taps you on the shoulder and gives you something you don't deserve? Grace. Grace. That's what you call it. Um, I, I constantly try to point that out because there are these people that say, if you talk about grace, you're just talking about just a little section of the New Testament and you're all about grace. No, God's all about grace. David didn't deserve to be king. He, he definitely showed from a lot of his character after God had him anointed that he didn't deserve to be king. But that's what grace is, folks. God giving us stuff we don't deserve. And so when we see these things, we need to... I point them out so you can see that God works through grace all through the scriptures, not just after the upper room, not just in the book of Ephesians, but in the entirety of God's word. When God found Abraham and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, I'm going to make a covenant with you, what was that? Grace. Okay, there you go. Um, and on and on and on and on, we see it everywhere. It's one of those things when you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. Um, and so I think it's the right thing to point it out. That, that God is doing that. Um, and so he establishes a condition, a, a covenant with David that had absolutely no conditions. Um, sometimes people ask me if I'll take them fishing, and I'll tell them yes. Whenever somebody wants to go, I'll try to take them. And uh, they don't have anything. Like, 
Dan wants to show up with a cane pole and a bucket. You know, you see people sitting <laughs> on the road. Like, no, just, you don't need to bring anything. I've got everything you need. Okay, I've got rods, reels, lures, food, water, uh, seasick pills. I had seasick uh, uh, ginger, but somebody ate on my ginger I used for seasickness. I'm not going to name any names. Um, <laughs> all that, it's there. It's free, okay? It's unconditional, okay? Now we know. I didn't say any names, Lisa. <laughs> um, and so that's what, you know, the, the covenant God made with David was completely unconditional. There was no, nothing he had to bring to the table. All he had to do was what? What did God expect David to do in this covenant? Think, guys. Hebrews 11. Walk by faith. That was the only expectation. Just walk, just believe God, right? Just believe God. It's that simple. God's acting in grace now. Just believe God and walk with him, and he'll deal with it. Um, it's kind of like he expects the same thing from us, right? Um, and so we see the fulfillment of the promises depend totally on the faithfulness of who? God. Who does our salvation, who does us remain, remaining saved depend totally on? us right because we got to be at church and we got to go to bible study and we got to no it depends totally on the power of god through christ not on us and and as i point these things out i, I mentioned a lot of times if you want to study theology you've got to go to the old testament because that's where we see theology but in theology god doesn't change okay we were we were saved by grace we walk by faith and god accomplishes things through us often in what in spite of us. We see the same thing in the Old Testament. We see the character of God revealed in these covenants, and that character of God never changes. It, it may be applied a little differently, but the basics of the character of God are always the same. And so we look back at guys like David and say, wow, David had an un unconditional covenant with God. How cool would that be? Duh. We've got something better in salvation, right? Well, we don't have a kingdom. Well, uh, I think you better reread the New Testament. We're part of a kingdom that's not going to fade away. Uh, so anyway, don't forget the character of God as you're studying the Old Testament. Get caught up in the story. Remember that God deals with us the same way. Um, this is an eternal covenant. I've got a verse on here, a couple verses we're going to look at. Uh, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. And... We find there, 2 Samuel 23, it says, Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. The point here is that David understands that God has made an everlasting covenant that will not go away with him. He's not going to be the one who caused it to happen. There are going to be issues, but it's an everlasting covenant. Um, let's go to First Chronicles, chapter 17. First Chronicles, chapter 17, verse 16. It says, And David the king came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord, and what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And yet this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, for thou hast also spoken to thy servant's house for a great, great while to come, and has regarded me according to the estate of a man of highest degree, O Lord. Uh, as you read on through that passage, you see that David is acknowledging that what God has done is miraculous, it's undeserved, and ultimately it's eternal. Um, let's go to Isaiah. I didn't type these on your outline basically because I was too lazy to type them. Isaiah chapter 55. And look at verse number 3. It says, Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And so... God is telling these people through Isaiah that he's willing to work and bless them, not because of them, but because of the covenant he made with David. These were obviously the house of Judah here. 
Uh, and so again, we see this idea of, of it being eternal. And then let's look at the one I actually have on your outline. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 33. I think we touched on this one earlier. I don't remember. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse number 20. Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and there should be not day and night in their season, they may also my covenant be broken with my servant David, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne with Levites and the priests my ministers. And so the idea here, God is telling them, if you read the whole passage, there's absolutely no way they can do this. Man cannot break his covenant. Man cannot cause God to break his covenant. It's an eternal covenant, and it will be there forever. Um, and so, uh, notice down in verse 24, Consider thou not what this people have spoken. Anyway, they go on and on. The people go back and forth, and basically God tells them, You can't break it. It's here. I said it. It's going to be here forever. So let's jump over in this last section here in the last couple minutes and look at Christ and the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Of course, the covenant is made with David, and he experienced some of the blessings of the covenant, but not all of them. And that's kind of consistent throughout these covenants, except for the new covenant, because the people Jeremiah talks to won't experience any of it. It's for the future. But did Abraham experience all the blessings of the promises God made him? No. Uh, he, he experienced some of them, but not all of them. Same thing in the Davidic covenant. Um, and we see the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in Jesus. Um, Let's look at Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And verse number 1. It said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy footstools thy enemy. The Lord shall send the rod of strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. This is a direct reference to who? Messiah, who we ultimately know would be Jesus. Um, and so the Messiah is at the Father's right hand. He'll rule and reign at the Father's right hand at the appointed time. He's going to return and rule on earth. Um, this will take place prior or just shortly after uh, Jeremiah's trouble. Let's look over at this passage, Jeremiah chapter 30. For those of you who have wondered where this uh, passage is Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. It says, Alas, for the day is great. This is Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass that in that day, saith the Lord, that I will break his yoke from off his neck, and will burst thy bonds, and uh, the strangers shall no more serve themselves, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. There's that reference to the fact that after the tribulation, David, resurrected David, will have some part in the rule of the Messiah. We're not, we're not exactly sure what it is, but uh, the time of Jacob's trouble is going to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ to come back and rule eternally. Um, Let's see. Let's go to Daniel. And the characteristics of this kingdom we find are everlasting. Daniel chapter 13. Or excuse me, Daniel chapter 7. Verse number 13. Daniel is giving a, uh, getting a vision here. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. And so we see here that the reference to this idea of the everlasting kingdom. And this is a part, an outgrowth of this Davidic covenant. Now it's interesting here. When you look at the Davidic covenant, most people think that David is promised a line and he'll rule only the Jews, right? Or Israel. Well, who is the ultimate king on the throne of the Davidic covenant? Christ, the Messiah. Look what his reign, his rule, verse 14. How many people are, is he going to rule? All nations. All nations, all languages, and he'll have ever, so... 
what we see here is this Davidic covenant, while it is true, it deals primarily with the nation of Israel, but when Christ comes to that throne, this thing is going to expand um, where Christ will be ruling and reigning in the millennial reign. So this everlasting covenant and Christ being a part of it is a part of the Davidic covenant. It's an outgrowth of the covenant. Um, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah. And by the way, we are just barely, barely, barely skimming the surface of any of these prophecies that have to do with the kingdom and, and Messiah. Isaiah chapter 9, this is, a, this is like a Christmas passage, right? Everybody knows this. We hear it around Christmas. Um, let's start in verse 1. It says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, uh, where is that mentioned again? Where do we hear about Zebulun and Naphtali? Anybody remember? Nobody. In Revelation, wasn't it? Nope. Nope. In the early parts of the Gospels, when we find out where the ministry of Jesus is taking place, um, they're mentioned. This is an area near Galilee that was trodden under by the Gentiles. It was called Galilee of the Gentiles because of the... Uh, the Roman highways that went through there and the huge number of Gentiles that lived there. Um, it says, After really did more grievously affect her by way of the sea, here it is, beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Um, so this was an area that Jesus would have come from eventually. And we see this uh, again in the Gospels. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwelled in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light shines. So this is all pointing to the fact of Messiah Look down in verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. There is not a comma in the original, so it's Wonderful Counselor, not Wonderful Comma Counselor. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is one of the unique natures of prophecy. In this one verse, we have a span of over, at this point, well over 2,000 years. For unto us a son is born. When, when did that take place? When Jesus, was born. when Jesus was born. Well, what about the rest of it? The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the increase of his government and peace. There should be no end. Haven't happened yet. And notice, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judge, judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. And then we see who's going to do it. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we see in these little passages here, everything from the birth of Christ throughout history to the tribulation to the millennial reign and the focus of Christ sitting on the throne. So we see this eternal uh, reference here to Jesus being on the throne of David forever done by the power of God. Uh, let's look at another one. We've got a little bit more time here. Let's go to Amos. How many of you have read the book of Amos? Okay, if you haven't read the Minor Prophets, you owe me foul poles. You need to read the Minor Prophets before next week. You are missing out if you've never read the Minor Prophets. Not long. I guess Zechariah is the longest one, but it's probably the most interesting. Um, if you get a chance, read them. You'll be glad you did. Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Amos chapter 9, verse number 11 says, in that day, prophecy, prophetically speaking, in that day is when? What day is it referring to? Day of the Lord. And that true or false, that is one day or is that one day? No, it's a time period. Okay. So in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. Okay. Wait a minute. God promised that he would have someone on the throne forever. Well, the nation's in captivity. The promise here is restoration. Okay. Um, and, and close up the branches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as of the days of old. And so here's God's promise that that line is not going to fail. God is going to be faithful. He's going to build it up. Um, and then let's go to Zechariah. I mentioned Zechariah a minute ago. The king is coming back. Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 4. Zechariah 14, verse number 4. Or let's go to verse number 3. Then shall the Lord go fight 
or go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle and his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. I've got some cool pictures of the sun coming up over the Mount of Olives. And I was looking at it thinking, man, one day this place is going to split. Um, and Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove to the north and half to the south. And you shall flee in the valley of the mountains, in the valley of the mountains you shall reach into Azal. Yea, you shall flee like you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. By the way, that's a historical event. You can find it in many different histories. Um, and the Lord, the Lord my God shall come and the saints with him. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day the light shall not be clear nor uh, dark, but it shall be a day which shall be known of the Lord. Not day nor night, but it shall come to pass at the evening time it shall be light. And we see on here, look down at verse number 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, that in that day shall there be one Lord, and his name shall be one. So we see the return. This is the establishment of the eternal line of David, who will reign forever. Um, and then we've got some New Testament references that we won't look at because we're running out of time here. Again, if you want more, there's tons and tons and tons of references to uh, the return of Christ, the millennial line, the line of David being preserved through Jesus and God miraculously working. But the, um, the Davidic covenant is a great promise. It brought us Jesus and all that he's accomplished for us, and he's not through. He's coming back. He's eventually going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, and God will fulfill that covenant. Okay, we made it. Any questions about the Davidic covenant? All right, well, let's stop there and we'll take a break.